Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. So said Philip K. Dick. So, what is reality? Is it all down to our perception? Why do sometimes we need to physically experience something or feel that we need to, to realize that it is reality? And so is the theme of tonight's story, another from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me so I could read them for everyone else. Number 125 by my reckoning. So, if you have a story, remember, you can share it and there's a good chance I will read it. Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Erica met her misfortune when our car hydroplaned, causing it to spin uncontrollably into oncoming traffic. Her vehicle spun directly under a semi-truck, decapitating her instantly, and as her head broke from her body, it fell at her side. Her long, red lock of gorgeous hair seemed to still flow in the sunlight as the rays captured each strand of her beautiful red hair. Tara met her untimely death when she fell off a balcony in New Orleans after being chased by a would-be rapist. A passerby found her laying on the sidewalk below, twisted and broken like a child's doll. The blood created a puddle that seemed to run into the street and down into the drain. Each stream was flowing down into a pile of rats that looked to find the blood and began licking it. When they picked up her body, they had to scare away at least twenty large rats that had seemed to find her in a short succession of time and were gnawing at her fingers. Ronald died suddenly after a drug overdose in a bathroom inside a concert hall. He still had his violin at his side, and when his friend found him, he was white as snow. His lips were pursed blue and purple, and the light in his eyes seemed to find themselves stargazing into the netherworld. The needle was still inside his arm, stiff as though it were nailing him to the bathroom wall. These are just three ways I have killed people in my stories. They say that writing is a form of possession in a way. I once heard that someone sits down inside of you when you go to write, and from there the stories take on life because they needed a soul. I had created many characters in eight short years, and they'd all been bestsellers. I'm not bragging by any means, but it was an excellent run for a time. And then, something changed. I couldn't seem to master the ideas to paper anymore. One snarling critic wrote of my latest novel, All of Miss Hartford's characters are one in the same. There's nothing new here. May as well read Patterson. <laughs> At least the endings are better. It was devastating. It got so bad that I avoided reading reviews on Amazon because well, some of the reviews were just mean and hateful. Worst thing I have ever read. Needs editing. Unrealistic. Don't waste your money. I planned to take an extended break between novels until my agent Andrea called me up one afternoon. Rachel, I have this new venture and I think you would be perfect. Do you, um, recall the Bentley case? I had recalled with vagueness the story of Emily Bentley, who was locked inside a small floor closet for six weeks by her next-door neighbour, who called himself Pazuzu after the demon in The Exorcist. He had been a proclaimed devil worshipper, and planned to impregnate poor Emily with the devil's seed. They caught him when Pazuzu had stolen her purse and used several of her credit cards, he was arrested, but later hung himself in jail. It had made the press at the time, and was quite the huge deal. Emily Bentley had refused interviews, but now I would be given special permission to interview her if I'd take the writing assignment. What do you say, Rachel? Maybe writing about something true will give your writing life again. Hey, it is something different, but still along the same lines as before. A horror story set in a small town, and the perpetrator is someone the main character knows. In this case, it was the neighbor. Look, you know I know everyone in publishing, and when they pitched the idea that they were interested in someone that could do the project well, I thought of you right away. 
she said in a hoarse voice, coughing a bit between words. I'm not sure if I'm the right person, but I'll, I'll try. Perfect. Can you meet Mrs. Bentley tomorrow over coffee? She's going to be staying at the Hilton downtown. If she likes you, she will work with you. I sighed in apprehension, taking down the address and time of our meeting, and then hanging up. I sat and stared at the small white piece of paper, hoping I was making the right decision. The next day, I went to the Hilton and met with Mrs. Bentley. She was nearly an hour late and didn't even bother to apologize when she sat down. Her hair was a mess and she wore a raincoat the entire time, although it was almost 70 degrees outside. I suspected someone like Mrs. Bentley, who was a severe trauma victim, would be, well, a bit off after everything that she'd gone through, but this was far worse than I'd expected. We ordered coffee, and she sat slurping it loudly while I asked questions. It's nice to meet you, Mrs. Bentley. I want to first say that I appreciate you taking this meeting. You want a story, so I guess I'll give it to you. My lawyer said it's a good way for me to make some money well, hiring a writer to tell my story. Said it could be a bestseller. Oh, I guess you're one of those or they wouldn't have sent you. She had a matter-of-fact tone about her, and I wasn't sure if she cared for me or not. <laughs> I have had some success, but mainly as a fiction writer. To be perfectly honest, I've never taken on true crime before, so I think this could be a new learning experience. <sighs> learning experience... She seemed annoyed by my choice of wording, and I thought, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. If you want to learn about real life and what people are capable of, maybe you should try locking yourself up for a few weeks. Chained, barely food and water with a threat of death or rape hanging over your head, then come to talk to me about life lessons. I looked at her and found very little to say. The waitress came back and then took our order, I declined anything else. Mrs. Bentley had tears in her eyes as she looked at me. We sat in silence until I found the courage to end our meeting. Uh, you seem nice, don't get me wrong. But unless you want to tackle this, well, I'd run like hell. I stood watching cupcakes melt in the sun, and women in their Sunday best, while the last of the afternoon sun glared upon all of us in my best friend's backyard. Diana, who I'd known since we were three years old, was having a first child at 31, and so there was a lovely Sunday picnic in her honour. Family and friends were all there, and I stood alone at one of the tables in the shade, reading text messages from him. Rachel, please don't do this to me. I ignored the persisting text from Jake, who, even in vibration tone on my phone, had that certain neediness to them. I'd ended it a week ago and decided to work on my marriage with Reginald. I stood reading and then deleting them one by one as I looked out at Reginald standing with a happy sort of grin on his face discussing literature or something with Diana's husband, Marlowe. Diana found me and noticed the distraught look on my face. Want to talk about it? She asked me. It's fine. Just a new project that I'm working on. I lied. No one knew about Jake, not even Diana. It had been my secret affair, and well, I was sorry about it now as I watched my husband. I guess it wasn't a surprise to me when it started. Jake was one of the personal trainers at the gym. I had begun to feel well, tired and put on ten pounds since Christmas, and so I asked Reginald for a gym membership. It was one of those fancy places with a spa and salon. He was more than happy to keep his young wife looking as beautiful as the day he'd met her nearly ten years ago now. I'd been one of Reginald's students in his literature class, where I attended college. Granted, it sounds taboo in the retelling of it, but I can assure you it was nothing of the kind. I was 22 when I met Reginald, and he was 40, unmarried, and, well, our relationship began after I'd graduated. Like all things... Our marriage grew stale after ten years. I wanted more out of our relationship. 
I wanted to go out more, meet more people. And he was just content, sitting at home reading or watching a game. We went to the occasional dinner party thrown by one of his colleagues, or we went to a movie at the local indie theatre. Well, I began hating that quiet life, married to an older man. I loved Reginald with all my heart, but it was just something was missing. That's when I met Jake. He was good looking. He had the most beautiful body. And, well, yes, he really was good looking. To say that I was attracted was an understatement. I was hot for him in every single way. I found myself doing things with him I would never have done with Reginald. The first time we had sex was in the back of his car, and it didn't stop there. We met in secret almost daily, whether it was on my lunch break or his. We went away for one weekend to Niagara Falls, but I insisted on us only paying cash for everything so there was no paper trail. We did manage to get photos of us together, but I made a point to ensure to delete them after I got home. The last thing I needed was Reginald finding out. Then, well, things with the Jake fizzled out, after I found he had secrets of his own. I was lying in the hotel bed that weekend in Niagara Falls, when I asked him about why he never invited me over to his house. Well, I guess I could ask the same question. He smirked getting out of bed, showing off his naked form to me. Sweat was still dripping down his back. You know why. I'm married. Same here. I don't know why it shocked me so much, hearing him admit he was married. That's, well, that's when it really hit home. Messing up my marriage was one thing, but messing up too? I realized then how stupid I'd been to allow myself to fail my husband in this way. The fantasy was over, the fairy tale idealism that Jake brought with him ruined in that one second. I didn't say much to him as he drove me back to where I'd left my car, some metro park we often met up in in the middle of the night. I broke it off with him then and there, and since then he sent me hundreds of texts. I made up my mind to get rid of the phone and get a new one, and a new number as soon as I could. Reginald found me just after Diana had, and he placed his arm around the waist of my dress and kissed my neck. Hey, beautiful. You almost ready to go? I thought how different he felt compared to Jake. Reginald was softer with the way he caressed me, and there was a poetry in his touch and patience that came with a man of his age. I looked at my husband, who had salt and pepper hair and wore clear glasses. He was handsome in his way. I turned my phone off and tossed it in my purse. We drove home holding hands, and when we got home, I thought we'd fool around for a bit. Only he was tired and quickly found himself asleep in the bed beside me. I sat up that night thinking and, well, was unsure about how to proceed both with Jake and Mrs. Bentley. I hadn't heard anything from Andrew about the meeting so I wasn't sure if things were going to go in my favour after the way Mrs. Bentley had treated me. I sent Jake one last text message that night. I'm sorry, Jake. This has to be over. I love my husband. Goodbye. I blocked the number and deleted all evidence. Tomorrow I would get rid of my phone for good and move on with my life. Or so I thought. I spoke to Andrea and was given the green light to continue my interviews with Mrs. Bentley. Something kept nagging at me, and that was the last critique I'd received, that I wasn't authentic enough or realistic enough. What if I failed again in my latest writing endeavour? I stayed up, and I finally fell asleep clutching my phone. I had strange, nightmarish dreams that night. I was being held against my will, and the person holding me captive had me blindfolded and tied up. I kept feeling as though I was having issues breathing and I awoke with a start. I nearly fed out of my bed, screaming. And when I did, I looked around the room, and I realized I was entirely alone. Reginald had already gone to work, and I looked down to see I was still clutching my cellular phone. I powered it on and sat up in bed, half expecting to see 80 text messages from Jake, but I recalled that I'd blocked his number. With relief, there were no messages, so I got up and showered. 
while I stood there letting the hot water run down my naked form. I couldn't stop thinking about that dream, because it gave me insight into the mind of Mrs. Bentley and the ordeal she had suffered. That must have been how she felt. But to recapture that feeling, I would give anything to be the best writer in the world. I would think at this moment, if there were a way to sell my soul to the devil, I would to be back at the top of my writing game again. Then it hit me, like a literal light bulb going off over my head. What if I could live that nightmare, even for just a day? I could document all my feelings and worst fears in real time, so that as I wrote Mrs. Bentley's ordeal, I would have first knowledge of it. Was it crazy? I suppose it was, and yet I didn't care, as I was desperate. Later that evening, when Reginald came home from work, I proposed the idea to him. He looked at me as though I'd lost all my marbles entirely, and wouldn't even talk to me at dinner. You are mad. I think you need a vacation, he said to me. But it would only be for a day or two, just long enough to allow me to grasp the sheer terror Mrs. Bentley felt in those moments. It's no different than a method actor. Why can't writers go method? I begged him over my pesto chicken. Because it's ridiculous. It isn't really. All you have to do is log me in the cellar in the basement. No, Rachel. Fine, I said, standing up and tossing my dinner in the garbage. And then, as I stood to pout in the kitchen, he came up from behind me and hugged me. Don't. What would people say? What if someone found out? It could be my reputation and yours. How would they find out? It's just for the weekend, and you'd be here each step of the way. If it gets too much, I'll bang on the door and you can let me out. He sighed, rolling his eyes. Shh, you can't just watch some horror movies like everyone else, or read some good Stephen King books. I could, but I want my own experience. I want to try something new. He finally agreed, even if he felt it was crazy. I had it all mapped out, how it would be for those two days and nights locked in the cellar. There would be no food, only a bit of water and a bucket to do my business, much like the way it was for Emily Bentley. I had the next few days to prepare, such as a noise barrier so that no one could hear my screams from outside the house. Well, that was on Reginald's suggestion, although, looking back, that might not have been the wisest idea. The morning of the faux kidnapping. I mainly ate breakfast over my coffee as generally as I could, and then around five o'clock sharp, he led me down to our cellar. All the supplies were there that I would need, which were very few. I was barefoot, wearing my pajama pants and a white tank top. As he looked at me, he seemed to have this worried look on his face. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. Make sure you come at exactly ten Sunday morning. Be scary if you want, like make sounds too, so I can get the full effect. He rolled his eyes at me, and then held out his hand. What's that for? Your phone. I need it if this is going to be authentic. Emily Bentley was under that house for weeks, and she didn't have her phone. If she had, she would have escaped a lot sooner. I handed it over to him, and then he bent down and kissed me. Thank you for doing this crazy thing, I said to him. Thag me later, he said, and then reluctantly shut the door, locking it from the other side. I yelled out at him. I love you. I didn't hear him respond to me. I only listened to a loud tap on the door. You really couldn't hear anything in here with the soundproof walls that Reginald had insisted upon installing. I sat there thinking, and then growing bored, I took out my diary. Day one, I said aloud as I wrote it down. I thought about the fact I couldn't hear any sounds outside this cellar. I only listened to my breathing and the beating of my heart. The basement itself was an eight foot by four foot room that we used as wine storage. But, well, we had no wine in here. I was the only thing in here currently. My diary and the walls. 
I sat there and waited. There was a small space above, that's where the air vent was, but it was so little you couldn't feel anything. I wasn't sure how much time had gone by, I just sat there, thinking. I wondered if Reginald would want to commit me to a mental facility after this, and for the time being, he was just humouring me until the proper authorities arrived. I sat there thinking about how much I love Reginald, and how bad I felt about the affair. It had been very selfish of me to do that to him. When this was over, I would consider having those babies he'd always wanted from me. I'd always kept that part of our lives on the back burner, what with my career at the forefront. Now, I realised, sitting here, with all this time to think, just how much this would change, well, with all those lessons learned. And then I heard it, through the air vent. I heard something that sounded like something falling. I hoped Reginald hadn't take a fall of some sort. I didn't hear any creaking from anyone walking on the floor above me. But then I listened to the air kick on, and what seemed like maybe the television through the air vent. I sighed in relief, thinking about him. I hadn't thought of what if something happened to him while I was down here. How would I hear it? I was slowly beginning to believe that this was a bad idea. Finally, I could take it no more, and I wanted to be out of here. This had been a stupid idea. Three or four hours had passed, and I decided it had been long enough. I stood up and began to bang on the door as hard as I could. Reginald! I yelled, as loud as my voice would carry me. Thanks to the soundproof walls we'd made, it was highly doubtful I was getting out of here by merely screaming for it. I put my mouth up to the air vent to get Reginald's attention. I realised after some thought that he was not coming for me. I could hear the television still, but it was so faint that chances were he couldn't listen to me over it. I felt the air go out of the room I was in suddenly, and I began to feel hot. Sweat moved down my forehead and the sides of my face. I took a deep breath, but it was hard to catch it, as the heat from that summer air had most likely been beating on our house all afternoon. More time passed, and then more before I fell asleep. There was only a small amount of light that snuck in the tiny room I was in, as it kept housed a small overhead light with a string attached. I couldn't bear to be in total darkness, but then something happened. Well, I didn't have a choice. The power to the house must have gone out, as I could feel everything grow quiet, and then the light went out just above my head causing me to wake from my slumber on that hard concrete floor. Even the air stopped moving, as I could no longer hear the motion of the fan. I stood up, and then I started to grow worried about Reginald. But perhaps he could now hear me if I yelled for him. I banged on the door as hard as my fist would let me, and then waited. After a few moments, I could make out shuffling outside the door. Reginald, I yelled. I don't want to be in here anymore. I, I've changed my mind. Please, open the door. There was shuffling. And then I listened to what I thought was someone laughing maniacally outside the door. I stood with my ear up to the door listening. Someone was there. As I did this, someone banged on the door as hard as I had before, rattling my eardrum into oblivion. I stood back, feeling very angry at Reginald. Was he doing what I'd asked of him? Well, I had told him that I wanted him to make sounds to help my fear factor. No, he was doing this to spite me. He was angry at me for this stupid decision to lock myself up, to understand how an actual kidnapped victim would feel. I sighed, sitting back on the floor, and then panic rose in me. The photos of Jake were still on my phone. How had I been so stupid? I never deleted them off my phone, and I was sure that if Reginald got curious, he would know it had not been a business trip I was on that weekend. Was this why he was doing this to me now? Was this payback? 
Tears met my eyes and were now falling down my cheeks as I collapsed to the floor. What if he knew? How would I ever explain myself? I realized then and there I would have to face the music. The lights were still off long after I fell back to sleep, and I had no idea how long I'd been sleeping or how much time had now passed. It was too dark to write in my diary, and it was the last thing I was thinking about now. All that mattered was me getting out of here. I sat in quiet for a long time, listening, but the power never came back on. I was growing hungry, and I was growing restless. I drank the water that Reginald gave me and peed in my bucket, but I had the promise that this would soon all be over. Was it a full day that had passed? I had no idea because I had no watch, only the glimmer of light that seeped in between the shadows, and that was now gone. Time was passing slowly now, and what I was sure was more than two days and nights had passed until I'd lost track of all time. I know it was longer than expected, because I figured out the meaning of the different shadows in the pitch black even. Through the tiny crack in the door that wasn't covered with soundproofing styrofoam, I could see the light coming from the outside world. When the light was gone, it was night. When it was there, even just barely, I knew it was still day. By my accounts, nearly four days had passed, and my little project was now turning into a nightmare. Then, something else unsettling began to happen. I felt it, something dripping on my shoulder and head. Water began to fall from the ceiling at first in drips and then in full faucet-like flows. I could barely make out how much and again I grew terrified. Where was Reginald? Why was he keeping me here? I started to bang on the door again and this time I kicked it and kicked it. I used all my might but I was tired and I was starving. The water kept flowing, and I could now feel a puddle growing under my feet, and it was slowly getting deeper. Something was dreadfully wrong, and I began to run horrible scenarios through my mind. The bathroom was just above the cellar, and what concerned me was, what if Reginald had taken a fall? Was he bathing and hurt himself? I listened to the outside world, but I heard nothing. I kept trying to break down the door until finally I felt it budge. I hit it again one final time and it opened slowly with a loud and long creaking. Then it hit something and began to come back towards me. What awaited me outside was something I had not considered or expected. Reginald was lying on the ground outside the door with an axe inside his skull. He had a tray of food that he'd had in his hands, and it was now next to him. The banging sound I'd heard must have been him tumbling into the door to his death. My hand shook, but even as I bent over to check for a pulse, I knew I would not find one. Reginald's body smelled, and flies were already buzzing around. Terrified, I had to find my phone to call the police. I hadn't considered that the perpetrator was still at large in my house. As I made my way up the stairs, I began to grow terrified, because I could again hear that water. I crept up the back stairs into the kitchen, and searched around for a weapon. I grabbed a knife, and then I heard it. Someone was walking around, and I quietly walked toward the sound of feet. There was someone in my room. I heard running then, coming toward me, and I began to run from the sound of footsteps toward the front door. And that's when I felt it. A hand reached out toward my shoulder, and I screamed as loud as I could and reached back with a knife I held in my shaking hand. The hand that touched me was one of familiarity, and the feminine grasp on my shoulder met this woman's eyes. Rachel, you're alive! Andrea stood back then when she saw the knife. Don't go in there, 
she said as my eyes moved toward the bathroom. I didn't listen to her as my feet slowly walked toward it with trepidation. I was still holding the knife when I saw it. There were wires everywhere, and they all led to the bathtub, which was now overflowing. Inside it was Jake, dead, with wires from every electronic gadget available wrapped around his neck. I was afraid to approach it, and when I got closer, I could see a note written with red lipstick on the mirror. If I can't have you, no one can. I pieced everything together in the following days, and I never revealed the reason I was locked in the cellar. I let everyone think it was because of Jake. They assumed he killed Reginald, locked me up, and then killed himself. Andrea had come by after not being able to reach me by phone. The front door was still unlocked from where Jake had broken it. In the following months, I went on to finish my book, and it became a bestseller. I titled it, Things You Do in the Name of the Devil. One of the comments that reviewed it, I will never forget, said, Authentic retelling of such a true, tragic story. However does Rachel Hartford do it? So there you go, my dear friends. We've done it. 100,000 subscribers. I honestly can't believe it. Have you got nothing better to do than listen to me? <laughs> well, you know, this is a reciprocal relationship. I love reading stories for you, and I know that you love listening to them. So thank you so much, everybody who's taken the time to subscribe, listen to the stories, click on the like button, and leave comments. Here's to another 100,000. All right? <laughs> okay. That's it for this evening, but of course I will see you again very, very soon. Sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>